getting ourselves in a posture and a position we can hear God more powerfully and more meaningfully. We've been uh, abstaining from meats and sweets, and uh, I know uh, some of us have uh, gone through the whole consecration uh, and not only done that, but also uh, increased our times of prayer, increased our times of, uh, of, 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 of study, of service, of ministry. Amen. And it is indeed uh, a great blessing to come out of the end of a consecration. And I don't know if you feel like I feel, but I feel I've got a little more power. I mean, a little more focus, a little more uh, ability to do what God has called me to do. And I'm praying that as a congregation we feel the same way. And uh, we're going to continue in this theme for uh, at least the first half of the year around moving forward. And uh, this next series will be a series that will be amplifying and hopefully unpacking and revealing the core values and principles of our congregational identity, which is to connect to God and one another in worship, grow in faith through small groups and discipleship uh, studies and serve the world in justice. And in this regard, uh, I believe there is a very important uh, part of how you and I are postured, particularly coming out of this consecration to be able to do that. I always appreciate my brothers and sisters that this is always a moment uh, of either great promise or great risk in the sense that we all have uh, the ability uh, to kind of snap back into some old behaviors now that we don't have this kind of compelling uh, spiritual discipline that is causing us to curb our desires and our appetites. Uh, and how many of you know after you go on a little bit of a consecration or a little bit of a diet or a little bit of a change in your attitudes or behaviors, sometimes uh, when you kind of feel like you finish your season of whatever it is, you have the tendency to uh, uh, be tempted to go back to how you were before it started to change or transformation. Anybody ever had that kind of temptation, right? So, so the key for us, I believe, is to make every effort to sustain and be consistent in where and how we have engaged this year thus far. And the biblical text that comes to us as our lectionary passage comes out of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. And let me give you a quick background of the book of Corinthians and this particular passage you have here in this passage, a uh, uh, particular conversation that is happening. The Apostle Paul has planted a church in the city of Corinth. And this is one of the major metropolitan cities in the Roman Empire. Uh, it is, in fact, a place where uh, it is very much known for its, uh, its uh, plurality and diversity in religion, known for its cultural kind of uh, prowess. It is a major port city, so many people come in and out of this whole region. And, and it is a place and a space where you do indeed find all kinds of different practices and ways of living. And here we're picking up in this text a particular conversation that is happening uh, because as people in the city of Corinth start to make decisions to follow Jesus, they are also faced with the kind of synchronistic or cultural kind of uh, practices that uh, are often uh, lifted up as it relates to can I still engage in these uh, events or, 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 or uh, practices uh, that may not necessarily be explicitly Christian. I think it's a very fascinating kind of context that this passage lifts up for us because I think if there is a, a place in the country that kind of reflects this kind of religious, pluralistic, cultural diversity and all kinds of practices and competing kinds of events and all stuff that's going on. Certainly our country is, is, is filled with places like this. And I think the Bay Area is certainly one of them. Amen. Mm -hmm. A place where you got all kinds of, of ideas and thoughts. Uh, another place could be New York or L.A. or, 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 or Atlanta or somewhere sometimes. You know, it's not all these different kind of places where you have these cultures colliding. 
in this particular passage, there are uh, some folks who have made a decision to follow Jesus, and they used to participate in worshiping other kinds of gods. And in their worship of these gods, they often were told and taught to bring uh, animals. They would sacrifice the animals on the altars of these gods. And when uh, they got done doing their religious sacrifice, there was food often left over. And uh, the question uh, that is up on the table here is, can people continue to engage, maybe not in the sacrificial ceremony itself, but can they continue to engage in the eating of the food that is left over when the sacrifice is happening? Caused a great big controversy. Here you have the uh, Apostle Paul weighing in on this controversy, but I think uh, you'll find uh, some very similar threads of, of uh, 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 relevance as we dig deep into this conversation around connecting to God and to one another. So let's read the whole passage. We're only going to pull a few verses out of it, but it'd be good for you and I to read it together so we can all kind of see what the context of the passage is talking about. Verse number one, first Corinthians chapter number eight. Now concerning food sacrifice to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Paul is saying, ain't no dummies in the house, all right? So everybody got a brain, amen? So put your thick caps on, amen? Ain't that good enough, amen? God ain't asked you to come to church and become no dummy, praise the Lord. Amen. He wants you to think a little bit. Amen? So you're ready to think. Is that all right? Amen. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Right. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by Him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists. And that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven and on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, right. the Father from whom all things are and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not every however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is the fire. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. I know some of y'all are like, I wish I heard this scripture before the consecration. Amen. Uh, tell your name very well, that's strategic. Amen. Or do what you needed to hear. Uh, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? Find that real fascinating, this little juxtaposition between liberty and conscience. Uh, a lot of liberty, but your liberty could damage some folks' conscience. I'm not preaching about that today, but I'm just struck me. So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family, you thus sin, I'm sorry, and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of God, for us the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic today, amen, of connect forward, connect forward. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read. For us the people of God, we ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and sin your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Pat yourself on the chest and say, I need to connect forward. I need to connect 
forward. Now, uh, here at the Way Christian Center, we have this grounding vision and purpose. We talk about our primary value being that of making disciples. And we want to be people here at the Way Christian Center who are constantly putting people in relationship with God. Helping to facilitate the process of your relationship with God becoming more meaningful. We should not take this for granted, as I was telling some of our leaders yesterday, uh, many congregations have many kinds of priorities or values, and all of them, uh, in and of themselves, I believe, flow out of the call and the unique uh, 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 assignment uh, of the congregation and their pastor, clergy leader. Uh, some of my, uh, 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 you know, pastor, clergy, friend conversations, uh, we all joke that, uh, you know, some of us, uh, our, our primary values uh, of having church can be reduced to nickels, numbers, and noise. Mm -hmm. Man, mm -hmm. folks will be competing about nickels, how much money you can raise, and numbers, how many folk you can pack in, and noise, how, how, how loud and good church can you have. Man, nickels, numbers, and noise. And I want to believe that uh, there is a deeper call than nickels, numbers, and noise. Right. Amen. 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 You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, the money that is necessary to do ministry. And certainly there's nothing wrong with numbers. Amen. Because uh, it sure would be hard to have community with just one. Amen. Amen. I know you, 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 you a deeply nuanced person. Man, but there is no such thing as a community of one. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and part of what we want to facilitate here, as we think of our mission and our call, is to connect to God and one another in worship as the primary gateway for how we help create the conditions for discipleship take place. It is the entry point of our discipleship process at the way to gather weekly in a large group together to remind ourselves that we are a part of God's body. It is an important point of reference to remember that being a part of God's body means that we aren't in relationship with God by ourselves. And part of that process also means that being in relationship with God means that I have to be in relationship with you. Man, that, you know, uh, uh, to the extent that I'm a part of the body of Christ uh, and, and, and you are a part of the body of Christ, amen, uh, just look at your own body, amen, uh, your toes are also connected to your hands and your arms and every part of you have connection and you can chop one of a part of your body off and that part becomes non-functional. So part of what we have to always remember is that to the extent that we are connected to God, we must be connected to one another. And this connection facilitates our discipleship process. You and I are called to be disciples, which I want to submit to you today will eventually put in jeopardy every other person, place, or thing that you have followed, that you are currently following, or that you will follow. That being a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, having your life and your ways shaped and, and moving towards the ways of God will call into question everything in your life. You can't be a follower of Jesus without your whole life being up for grabs for the sake of the gospel. Following Jesus is, you know, high stakes deal. But I want to submit continuously as we talk about this that uh, the most precious part of you uh, is the part of you that will never die. And uh, I want to follow Jesus here and now because I want to believe that the process of following Jesus here and now will allow me to, that part of me that will never die, to follow him into eternity. That the fellowship that I start with 
God now will continue into eternity. You hear what I'm saying? Amen? Amen. That this is not just something that I'm doing just because I don't have anything else better to do, but I want to believe that uh, I have a high stake uh, uh, thing in play, and that is my soul, that it is the eternal nature of the fellowship of my soul with God. And following Jesus will lead me right into the right relationship with God. Following Jesus, becoming a disciple becomes an all consuming enterprise because if you are not following Jesus, I want to submit that you may be following yourself. <laughs> and I know we got a lot of smart folk here in the house, a lot of people with a lot of degrees from all kinds of universities and all kinds of colleges and all kinds of, of advanced uh, uh, learning centers, etc. And, and, and some of us got the, the, the PhD from UC Berkeley, some of us got the PhD from the School of Hard Knocks, amen. Uh, but all of us got some degree, amen, amen. All of us got some knowledge base that we will always be referring to. Paul is very powerful in the way that he talks about this. Uh, he says that in verse number two that, that, that all of us have some knowledge. But he goes on to say uh, that even the knowledge you have uh, should help you to realize that you don't know a whole lot. <laughs> Anybody ever met someone who thinks they know everything? Amen. Yeah. Just know it all. Amen. Yeah. That's your name of that too, isn't it? Amen. Ain't nothing like being around you. Amen. Amen. So Solomon, he, 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 the wisest person, and he, he seems to suggest that too much knowledge is too much grief. Amen. You got too much knowledge, amen. You can't never just chill, amen. Because you just always try to solve something or, or comprehend something or reflect on something. Amen. This idea that, that, that knowledge, knowledge, the possession of knowledge, the more you know, often leads you into a place where you start to realize that you may not know as much as you think you know. And it, I believe, lifts up this alternative that really is no alternative. And if you're not following the ways of Jesus and you're following yourself, you have a very limited perspective. Because with all the knowledge that we have, how many of you know knowledge changes? Don't you know that there was a time the smartest person alive thought the world was flat? Yeah. And I mean, they were burning folk at the stake. If they disagreed with them, that the world was flat. We're talking about some smart folk. We're talking about all the, you know, PhD folk that ain't that. Right? I remember when I was uh, uh, taking my science class growing up, and I, 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 I uh, talked about how many planets are there, and I wrote 10 down there, and I got it wrong, and you know, didn't get a good grade on that test, because they told me at the time it was only nine. I was reading the science journal the other day, and they tell me now there's 10 planets. I feel like we should go back in time. Change my grade. Tell you, neighbor, knowledge changes, amen. Amen. So, so it's important for us to appreciate that even with all the knowledge we have, the knowledge you have is limited. Yes. Being connected to God allows you and I to be connected to a source of knowledge that allows us to be able to have whatever we need. Whenever we need it, however we need it. Wherever we need it. Right, right. And I want your connection to God and to one another to be a primary component of how you understand your spiritual development and following of the ways of Jesus. Because I'm, I'm fearful that we as a people in this time are connected to everything except for God. We have connections to internet, we have connections to, to hobby, we have connections to money, we have connections to privilege, we have connections to people, places, and things. But my question to you, my brother and sister, is 
is your best connection, your connection to God. And if it is not, how then do you and I make sure that our process of discipleship, of being a follower of Jesus, is strengthening that connection? Part of what we want to appreciate, particularly as we are moving into this passage, is the connection we have allows and affords us privileges, allows and affords us access, allows and affords us direction that otherwise would leave us a little unsettled. And part of what we find, I believe, when we're reading the book of Corinthians is this perpetual struggle to make sure that my connection to God, my connection to the church or the people of God, and my connection to the world always have the right kind of priorities and interaction. And it is in this way that I believe when you and I are connected to God most intentionally, our relationships with one another, at least in the body, become more loving, more life-giving, and definitely more empowerful. Now, it's clear to me, in my experience, that there are some folk who are easier to love than others. <laughs> Somebody say it. <laughs> anyway, and, 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 you know, there's a whole lot of reasons why that could be. But when you are connected to God, I believe that the love you have for God must overflow with your interactions and relationships with others. Thomas Merton, he says it like this, that our job is to love others without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. Put that on the screen, take for me. Our job is to love others whether or not, I'm sorry, without stopping to inquire whether or not they are worthy. And this, to me, is an outcome of how God loves us. Yes. It is the model, right? Because can you imagine what your life would look like if God took out his report card to see if you were worthy of his love today? Amen. Some of us will be uh, a little lonely. Amen. Amen. We, our, our, our proximity to God, our interaction with God may be a little reduced if it was grounded in our worthiness to receive love from God. But if God can love you, why can't God love the brother and sister next to you? Mm -hmm. And if God can love them, then why can't you love them? Without first waiting to see, are you worthy of my love? Yeah. It is important, I believe, in this moment of fragmentation and increased kind of isolation in our culture, in our world, for us to be people <coughs> who are able to have a connection to God that is always grounded and overflowing with the love he shows us and us showing that to one another. We sing a song, we sometimes still sing a song, as God Walker said, I need you, you need me, we're all a part of God's body, right? I need you to survive. And being a part of God's body means that you can't be connected to God rightly, you can't love God rightly, if you can't be connected to God's people, you can't love God's people rightly. John said it like this, how can you say you love God who you have never seen, but you can't love the one that you see every day? What does that suggest? It suggests that the ones you see every day are the express image of the God you can't see. Woo! Oh, help me in here today. If I can't love the God that is expressing God's self every day, then maybe the love I have for the God I can't see is not real. And thus, 
is the great challenge of being connected to God and God's people at the same time. Being connected to God, my brothers and my sisters, should enhance your connection to other people and force you to ask questions now in this moment. What relationships need greater attention for me to be able to have love for God that is genuine and authentic? Here in this passage you see that Paul then begins to lift up a very important set of arguments for the people who are trying to figure out what does it mean in the midst of all of this difference and all of these competing kinds of claims and all of these different kinds of activities? What does it mean to be faithful to God? And the first thing that I want to suggest to you today, we're talking about having a serious kind of movement forward in our connection is you have to make the connection to God. Make the God connection. Everybody say that. Make the God connection. Make the God connection. Now, it is clear here in verse number five that Paul is using the pluralistic kind of worship of God, the multi-faith dimensions of his time to make an argument over and against the kind of assumptions that people have in that day. Paul is saying very clearly that there is only one God and we are worshiping that God. The worship of that one and true God is the God you and I must make a connection to. Now understand, my brothers and sisters, that the kind of connection you make is great, I'm sorry, making the right connection to the right God will determine the power of the kind of life that you get at. I love Psalm chapter number 16, verse 4. And it says it like this. Don't just go shopping for a God. Gods are not for sale. I swear I'll never treat God names like brand names. My choice is you, God. First and only. And now I find I'm your choice. And I want to submit to you that there is a whole lot of choices that you and I can make in this panoply, this plethora, this, this marketplace of gods. And we're living in a time where people are kind of, you know, picking and choosing what part of God they like. Amen. 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 I like the God that, you know, uh, uh, kills all my enemies. So that's the kind of God that I like today. Amen. Or I like the God that, that, that only loves. Amen. So that means part of my life that, that is out of line with God. You know, I ain't got to worry about that. But I like God that, you know, uh, uh, is, is the God of, 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 of a particular uh, cultural slant. So that's the kind of God that, that I'm going to prioritize. And I like the God of, of prosperity because, you know, I got a lot of money and I want a lot of money. And that's the kind of God that I like. Amen. Now, how many of you know the God, the true God, will never make you feel too comfortable? Amen. 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 There's a whole lot of parts of God that will often rub up against us and force us to have moments of transformation. It's important for us to appreciate that the connection to the right God, to the true God, is a part of who and what we are called to contend with. Yet, for us, there is one God, a Father who, through whom, are all things and for whom we exist. You must make a choice in your life which God you will serve. Because it matters. Yes. Slide we have up there, it says you are free to choose, but you are not free from the consequences of your choice. Mm -hmm. And this is so relevant when we think about who we will serve. Mm -hmm. Joshua, I believe it was Joshua, told the children of Israel, when they were all kind of trying to figure out what God they was going to Serve, they always kind of trying to serve the, all the gods. Amen. Joshua said, you got to choose today who you're going to serve, Israel. Amen. Then Joshua stood up and said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the God that brought us here. Yes. Yes. You know, the God that brought us through the Red Sea, the Jordan, the wilderness. Yes. Amen. The God that brought us through all our 
hellish conditions. Yeah. Ain't it something that when folk arrive, all of a sudden they don't need God no more? Amen. 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 They, why? Because they've chosen another God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But I believe there's always a moment in your life where you, the God you've chosen, will not have the power to sustain you like the God that brought you through. Yeah. That's why we must make the right connection to the right God. Right. Critically important. Because there's going to be a lot of competing gods out here. Yes. Folks yes. wanting you to connect to it. Yes. Folks wanting you to connect to its values. Its ways of life and ways of thinking. But when you are connected to the true God. Now, I know for some of us who have drunk deeply from the waters of postmodernism, these absolute claims, they just make us uncomfortable. You know, you start squirming. Can't all roads lead to the same destination? Tell me where that works. <laughs> I mean, I could be driving, trying to get to L.A., and if I get on I-80 going east, east, I can say, I'm going to L.A. Woo, I'm going on a road trip. <laughs> road trip. Oh, that's where I'm going. I'm going on a road trip. <laughs> you can drive as long as you want to on I-80 east, and it won't get you to L.A. Tell your neighbor, all those don't lead to the same destination. <laughs> now, I can't be clear or sure about where all these other roads may lead you. Yeah. But I can be sure where following Jesus will lead you. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because we have a history yes, sir. of where Jesus leads us to. Right. That's why folks say, where he leads me, I will follow, no turning back. Why? Because my eyes are set on Jesus. Thank you. Now, understand, in the Christian tradition, theological kind of expression or conversation about God is often through the Trinity or the Godhead. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It is this idea that it, within the life of God there are uh, 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 Persons or 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 masks or face. There are personas, right? And it, it denotes that within the life of God there is relationship. It is distinct but not divided. We don't have three people sitting up in heaven, amen, uh, uh, arguing over who's gonna be God today. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit do not have that kind of uh, 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 interaction or relationship. It is a, the biblical or the, the theological term is perichoresis. It is a interpenetratable uh, overlapping. It is intertwined. You cannot separate it out. It is all together. The three are making one. It speaks to the relational nature of how unity within the Godhead is possible. Thus unity among the body of Christ. in the body of Christ. And this kind of unity, this kind of, of community within the Godhead reminds us that we must be connected to one another and that connection means that when one show up, all of us show up. Gregory of Nancy Andrews, he's a whole school uh, church father, he says that when I say God, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when I say Jesus, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when I say Father, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when I say Holy Ghost, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When I say God, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Because you can't have one without all three of them showing up. This is so important, right, to stress the connection, the power of connection. I want to be connected to God because I believe it is this God who has created me. Before I was formed in my mother's womb, this God knew me. Before I was a glimmer in my parents' eyes, this God determined and put something special inside of me. And if I'm not connected to this God, then I'm connected to Oh, God. 
time in school. Uh, religion is going to make me a better me. And I want you to know that uh, this Christian faith is not interested in making you a better you. Yeah. This Christian faith don't really care about the current you. This Christian faith want to make you a different you. Yeah. The you that God thought about. When God first brought you into existence. Mm. And sometimes, can some of us be honest, amen, that life can change us. Hello, somebody. Yeah. The hardness of life can transform us into things that we don't even want to be ourselves. <clears throat> Man, I was reading uh, uh, this, this, this article in uh, the New York Times about the transgender uh, 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 young person who was set on fire by the young African American uh, boy, uh, Richard. He, transgender, a person named Sasha and the, the young boy's name was Richard. And, and you should read this article. Yeah. It's just a very, very hard article to read. What I wrote, I think is, it was hard because you see the cascading traumas that work in, but you also see all the ways in which the justice systems of our world are not adequate to heal us. Amen. Yeah. And this young man, uh, Brother Richard Thomas, and I focus on, on him, uh, uh, just because it, it, it struck me, uh, the, the, the trauma that was called to, caused to Sasha was very clear. You know, in the immediate, uh, lighting the clothes on fire. And, and the clothes that were then on fire scarred Sasha's legs and caused Sasha to have all kinds of, you know, very, uh, very uh, visible scars that forced people to have certain kind of outrage and compassion. Yeah. And it, it required a whole lot of excavation of Richard, 16-year-old black kid, black boy from East Oakland, a lot of excavation of his life to pull out all the trauma yeah. that he had experienced. That three or four of his friends have been killed. That his aunties have been killed. That he'd been in and out of schools and in and out of all kinds of uh, institutionalized places and spaces. And that even in that space, he was being asked why he did it. And he was saying because he didn't like gay people. And then he came back around later and, and acknowledged what he do like gay people because his family member is gay and he was socialized a certain kind of way. And by the end of the article, you may have started out feeling Oh, sorry for Sasha and angry at Richard, and by the end, I felt sorry for both of them. Because life has a way of changing us in ways that we didn't sign up to be changed. Amen. Yeah. 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 It is why we must be connected to the God who created us. Yes, yes, yes. Because the God who created us can repair us. Yeah. Oh, have mercy. But if you're connected to a false God, right. you may be crying out one day, but that God can't hear you because that false God that's not real don't have no ears. You may be crying out one day for that God to come and visit you, but that God can't because that God can't even move. God ain't nothing but a stone image. Yeah. Make the connection to the true God. First point, all I'm saying, I feel like I'd have kicked that dead well down the beach long enough. Amen. Amen. Make the connection to the true God. You can never high five and tell them, make the true God connection. Make the God connection. The second thing that I think Paul is lifting up in this text is that you and I must avoid idolatry. Right. Now, Paul is very clear. church and we just are always finding it hard to tell the truth when we're in church. You know, so kind of interesting. Uh, uh, I don't know. It's very deep. Very deep. Very deep. But, 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 but I believe that uh, every day of our lives there are idols asking 
asking for us to take an altar out and put some sacrifices on that altar. And some of us unwittingly do it without even knowing we're doing it. We participate in systems and structures that have already determined that they are not going to serve the one and true God. And I believe that even in our own culture, in our own country, we have set up idols and we have set up things that are more likely to get our worship, more likely to be prioritized than the worship of this one and true God. And you and I, as followers of Jesus, must guard ourselves against idolatry. <clears throat> Part of what I'm starting to understand even more so is that our country has this uh, national religion that is often cloaked in Christian language. But when you peel it back, Jesus ain't in the middle of nothing like that. If I were to describe what our country's God is, amen, you know, in God we trust, amen, they're not talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Don't get it twisted up in here. Why does that matter? Because that God would require us to live our lives differently in this country. Amen. You can't claim to trust the one true living God and be killing up folk all over the place. Oppressing folk all over the place. Doing it with great skill. The perfecting the art of oppression. They packaged it up in a nice package with a bow on it and an M16 and they just farmed it out. That's not the kind of God that we trust in. Amen. And it is easy, I think, easier to tell by how we invest our resources. Dr. King said it like this, that a nation that continues to spend more money on military and weapons of war is a nation approaching spiritual doom. Now, you know, we all love our king because our king starts telling us the truth. <laughs> so I, you know, I pulled up this budget that was just put out recently about, you know, kind of help drive the point home of how our country spends the trillions of dollars we Uncle Sam takes some of our money out. And guess where our money is going? Hmm. Ain't going to education. Hmm. Ain't going to help veterans or government or housing or Medicare, or Social Security, or, 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 or food. <laughs> Folk hungry in this country, we ain't got enough money to, to help people eat. But we got trillions of dollars we can spend on making war. Yeah. The idol of our country is money, violence. According to this, this is not the God that we are serving. And, and how is this relevant for us to follow Jesus? Well, I continue to find that as we're doing this work all across this country, even in our communities, idolatry is setting itself up even in our local cities, even how these budgets are being determined. Because as we're trying to make peace, how many of you know Will be the thing. 
thing that has the most power in your life. Then the final thing the scripture talks about in this passage, I believe, is important for that connection. God is that we must worship Him. One and true God. I love this, this quote. It says, true worship that is pleasing to God radiates throughout a person's entire life. Worship is not only relegated to Sunday morning. It has to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Take root in your heart. 
It's important for us to, to, to always be mindful. Don't, don't, don't think you so, so like, you know, uh, 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 immune from idolatry. Yeah. Idolatry, we got to check that. we got to make sure we're engaging in the practices of worship so we can have acts of worship. Connect to God and one another in worship. This is our gateway to discipleship.